time to introduce to you your host, Susan Barger, on behalf of the FAIC. Go ahead, Susan. Hi, everyone. Um, we're happy to have you here. And uh, so I'll just run through my slides, and then we'll get on with the webinar. So um, the best way to keep informed about us is to use the C2CC announce list. This is the um, website you can go and sign up. Or you can like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. Um, and if you need help due to, due to a disaster, a flood, a fire, a, an earthquake, a volcano, whatever it is, you can always call the number. It's available 24-7. And it's people who are trained to help uh, respond to uh, problems relating from emergencies with heritage materials. If you have a question, you can put it in our discussion forum. And I just want to warn you that the, the, uh, over the summer, the discussion forum is going to change. It's going to begin looking something like this, but it'll have our logo on it. And that should make it much easier to chat and ask questions. But it will still be, we'll still have monitors answering questions. So you'll have real conservators answering your questions. And so um, you can look forward to that. And you can contact me anytime. This is my email address. And um, we're going to be sort of quiet for the next few months. We're going to have a survey that's going to go out probably the end of this month into August. Our next webinar is in August, and that is for uh, is going to be about caring for problematic materials. So problematic materials might include uh, Confederate monuments. That's the ones we all know about. But there are other kinds of problematic works. So that's uh, that'll be that webinar. And in the meantime, look for changes on our website, and uh, especially with the forum. So uh, I'm now going to turn this over to Priscilla Anderson. She is our um, presenter today, and I'm going to let her introduce herself. Go ahead, Priscilla. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Susan said, my name is Priscilla Anderson. I am a preservation librarian, and I'm also the co-chair of an emergency team that serves over 70 libraries at Harvard University. Uh, today's topic is how to learn how to use a learning approach to improve your organization's emergency preparedness. Um, so I'm not going to talk about the specifics of how to salvage collection materials today, because many other people have done that very well. But I will talk about different types of training and how you can learn from real life emergencies to speed up your recovery and improve your next response. And for those of you that might find yourself in the role of an instructor or a facilitator, I'll also be passing on some train the trainers tips. You should also note that I love yoga, but I'm really bad at it. Um, it is all about the practice, not about making it perfect. And I just want to say that I think the same is true for emergency preparedness. I've learned everything I know about emergency preparedness on the job. So the list that you see on the left um, are some skillful instructors that have graciously allowed me to teach and to learn alongside them. And my rocks are Jane Hedberg over on the right, um, who is my predecessor here at Harvard, and Lauren Telepak in the center who is currently my co-chair of Harvard's Library Collections Emergency Team. She's the one who makes all of our training events come together like clockwork. I'm also grateful to Harvard for letting me take work time to present this webinar. And I want to give a shout out to COSTEP for Massachusetts. And that means, or that stands for Coordinated CO Statewide ST emergency preparedness. Um, and it is a wonderful resource for Massachusetts cultural heritage organizations. It's made up of people from institutions like many of yours. So I get a chance to step 
outside of Harvard's Ivy Covered Tower when I do training with COSTA. Uh, most of the photographs and the slides to follow were taken during training sessions at Harvard by conservator and professional photographer Catherine Bado Costello, to whom I am indebted for recording these events so artfully. And now I'm going to invite you to contribute your perspective to the webinar by taking a few interactive polls. So Mike, if you could please queue up the first four polls. Thank you. So please do fill out these polls whenever they pop up on your screen. And you can just start right away whenever you see them. I am going to keep talking so that you don't think there's some glitch with the sound. But don't worry. I'm not going to say anything too important while I'm asking you to do this work. I see that you're already starting to chip in your answers. If you are attending the webinar as a group, I just want to say it's fine for you to answer collectively, or you could just give the keyboard to a delegate who might be the person who's checking her phone right now. Um, there are several reasons that we're going to do these polls with these initial ones. What I'm trying to do is gather some information so that I'm going to be able to match my content to my audience. And then the rest of the polls are going to be about helping you to reinforce what you're learning along the way. Um, at the end of the session, I will give you a mechanism for having your poll answers and your chat entries sent to you individually. And I'll talk about that later. All right. So how are we doing? Are we slowing down here? People still working on it? Um, I see the numbers changing. What do you think, it Susan? It looks like we're probably ready to go on. All right. Could you give me a rundown of who is participating and who I'm talking to? So the largest number of people are from museums, followed by libraries, archives, historical societies, um, some government agencies, and, um, and then a few zoos, aquaria, visitor centers, service providers, and others. So um, and then we have um, we have mostly people from smaller institutions, some larger. So that and about sixty eight percent have had uh, an emergency. And I'm not sure what poll number four is. Um, so poll number four is. For those people who have had an emergency, do you feel like your response was um, was able to keep people safe? Were you able to assess the situation and communicate? Were you able to prevent further harm? So it's sort of a, an assessment of you know how how did the response go? Um, and it looks like you know most of you thought you, you were capable. So that's great. Right. All right, so I'm going to ask Mike to toggle me back to the presentation for one last, I'm waiting for it to load. Um, so one last question for you guys. Um, and this is, I'm going to ask you to type this into the chat box. If you could type your job title or other brief description of what you do at your organization, because that also will help me kind of get to know you and what your role is. That would be really helpful. And I see you're typing away, so thank you. Right, so we have catalogers, registrars, archivists, museum technicians, conservators, directors, I'm glad to hear that there's a, there's a director or two out there. Um, yeah. I do have some specific comments for you guys. <laughs> but I, I think, you know, I'm hoping to 
to um, have something to interest everybody. OK. I think I'm going to leave that, even though I still see things rolling in. But um, uh, I'm going to proceed ahead. So here's an outline for what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I believe that you can learn something at really every point in the emergency preparedness life cycle. So I'm going to show you how to use training to create and update emergency plans. And you know how immersion is a good way to learn a language? Well, it's also a great way to learn emergency response. I'm also going to encourage you to roll up your sleeves and practice salvage. And then we'll use a learning approach to look forward instead of backward when you're doing after action reviews. But before we get into the nitty gritty of emergency training, I want to sing the praises of approaching each phase with a learning mindset. Um, so I'm going to talk about the advantages of of doing so. First of all, the shock of a collections emergency deprives you of at least half of your brain power until things normalize. So learning about response ahead of time helps convert what you learn into instincts. And that helps to make up for your reduced ability to analyze or make decisions in the emergency. Learning mode also helps you stay flexible and increases your resilience. This comes in handy since all emergencies are new territory in some way. Um, I have to say, if I tried to do this move while doing yoga, it would quickly become an emergency situation because I would probably faint and break my neck. But I guess you have to work your way up to it. So when you're in learning mode, all of a sudden, it's OK to ask questions and not have answers. And in my experience, I think this leads to more thorough and thoughtful decisions during the planning phase. When you're learning, it's also OK to make mistakes and to experiment or improvise. This workshop participant just opened a wet book, and all the pages fell out onto the floor leaving him holding the empty book cover. But you see, nobody's mad at him. Everybody's kind of laughing along with him. Um, and now he has to figure out how he's going to keep those two parts together. So the last thing I'll mention as an advantage is that a learning mindset helps to keep everyone looking on the bright side and moving forward not getting stuck regret, regretting what happened before. And so the result, in a real emergency, you're less likely to be paralyzed by indecision. And staying positive enables you to come up with creative solutions to problems that you've never seen before. So that was my ode to a learning mindset. And now I'll talk about different modes of learning. There are three basic categories of learners. You've got visual, who use your eyes, aural, A-U-R-A-L, using your ears, and kinesthetic, um, using pretty much any other part of your body. In a workshop, you should have something for each kind of learner. For readers, I usually provide handouts ahead of time and resources for more reading after the workshop. Now, those of you who are readers might think that I don't have enough text on my slides for you to read, but I'll explain that in a minute. Visual learners who prefer watching really like demonstrations. And this mode is really good for uh, scary stuff, like learning how to move a huge and floppy, fragile, wet poster, which is what's happening at the front of that room right there. For you trainers out there, I will say that I find it difficult to talk and demonstrate at the same time. So I like to have a buddy narrate what I'm doing.
it's for the listeners that I don't put a lot of text on the slides. Um, the human brain automatically prioritizes visual input over oral. So having a lot to read means it's harder for you to hear what I have to say. So I keep written text brief so that the listeners will have an equal shot at the content. You can think of the text in the slides like clothespins that hold the spoken content onto the line. Some oral learners also like asking and answering questions. And I think it increases, increases engagement for everyone. And it kicks our brains into higher gear so we learn more deeply. Kinesthetic learners like to do stuff uh, and use their motor skills to process information. Hands-on training works great for them. Real emergencies are also a good way to get learning by doing. If you are an experienced responder, be sure to bring an understudy so that someone else gets to learn. And if not, then still bring a buddy with you, and you'll help each other figure it out. The next best doing, thing to doing is pretending. You use your imagination to project what you would do if it were a real situation. I just have to say that role playing is difficult for many people. So it helps to have a ringleader who is game for some improv to get everyone started. I never know what an audience's preferred modes of learning are. Um, so one way that I try to gauge a little bit at the beginning is by asking participants what their goals are for the workshop, um, what they want to learn. I also share what I want them to learn. And then at the end of the session, we do a check-in. Um, we photograph and review these blackboards at a debrief meeting after the workshop is over. And so this is also a good way for me to learn how to teach better. Oh, that was a lot of learning about learning. OK, so now it's your turn. Mike, can you please give us the next two polls? So have at it. Uh, first, I want to know what will motivate you to want to keep learning? And then I want you to think about your learning mode. What is the most comfortable and most effective for you? Me, I am a watcher and a doer. I'll be curious to see how many of you are listeners, because that is the most predominant mode in this webinar format. But so far, it looks like the listeners are not taking the lead. That's interesting. When you're done with the polls, I want you to feel free to type questions into the chat box. Um, we will look at the questions toward the end of the session, but I'm going to invite you to ask your questions when you're thinking of them. Um, you may note that the polls are slightly manipulative. So in poll number five, I wrote the, uh, the question with the assumption that staying in learning mode is important to you. Um, and then notice that I got you to prioritize the possible reasons, which makes your brain think harder about the choices and hopefully helps you to remember them better. Sneaky, huh? All right, Susan, uh, what, what are our polls looking like here? Well, it looks like um, most people want to improve decision making and keep their presentations fresh. And um, that doing and watching are probably the biggest modes they want. And for the people that are asking, I, I will post the recordings, the handouts, and any trailing questions in a, in a, and along with the PowerPoint in a couple of days. So you can just check the, the website. And I usually put out an announcement that it's posted. So that should answer um, Jasmine's question. 
Great. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, so, Mike, can I go back to the presentation? Thank you. All right. So, I have a recurring nightmare. Um, I didn't have it last night, but I have it sometimes. Um, and it's pretty typical. I have to take an exam, but I haven't studied for the exam, and I can't even find the room to take the exam. So I just want to say that this is what an emergency feels like if you don't know the contents of your emergency plan pretty well. You can get all bound up in anxiety and frustration. So let's talk for a minute about when are some opportunities that you can do emergency training. And I call these the nodes for learning. So my favorite time to schedule workshops is a couple of weeks before performance reviews, which in a big organization like Harvard, take place around the close of the fiscal year. So this gives people something to write on their goals for the upcoming year, like I will work with our facilities manager to get that broken window replaced, or I will get my coworkers' cell phone numbers into my cell phone so we can get in touch remotely. Um, or even, I will train 30 people how to funnel water that's dripping from the ceiling into a bucket. Some people say they don't have time for training, but there is usually an ebb and flow of, of deadlines throughout the year. Um, so you can also try to target that, that downtime that's in between events or exhibitions or seasons. And another tactic is to chop it up into small bites. You can do a five-minute tip session, pack it on to the end of a staff meeting. Um, so in this image, my colleague Lauren is showing people how to tell the difference between acetate and polyester audio tape, um, which makes a difference when you're trying to prioritize, prioritize those things in an emergency. Another idea is if you, if you yourself take a training, you can then recap the highlights for the rest of your staff so they get to benefit from what you learned. And you could do that with whatever you take away from this webinar. Mistakes are the one node for learning that you can't really plan. I think the best way to recover from mistakes in general is to learn from them because that allows you to accept responsibility and then just to move on. In this photo, these two participants took a box off of a shelf quite cleverly with a support board underneath to keep the soggy bottom from dropping out. But they neglected to remove the water that had pooled on the lid before removing the box. So they both got soaking wet. But they'll never do that again. So uh, these four things are my favorite nodes of learning. But um, what is the worst time to learn? Well, I think it's when the tornado sirens are going off because all you have are your instincts, and you don't have time or brain space to dust off and read your old emergency plan. Um, the second worst time is right after lunch when postprandial stupor sets in. So I always try to do workshops in the morning. And I'm hoping you all aren't asleep yet. Just in case, here are a couple more polls to wake you up. So Mike, can we have numbers 7 and 8, please? OK. So these are a challenge. You might not know the answers, but think about how your boss or your organization's director prepares for a new kind of event, or maybe writing a new policy. Do they like to read up on the topic? Talk to several individuals to hear different perspectives? Or maybe they convene a brainstorm meeting um, to figure out some different ways that it might work? How about your facilities manager? Or if you don't have one, how about your plumber? Maybe who has to learn how to install a newfangled high efficiency hot water heater. You think they read the manual, watch a YouTube video, talk to someone who has done it before, 
or maybe they just figured it out by, by sticking a wrench in and trying it. So now I want you to think on a meta level about questions like these and how they help you to learn. So notice that I got you to review the list of six learning modes and then evaluate them in two realistic but unknown contexts, as in I don't know the right answers and maybe you don't, but you've gone through the exercise. So I hope that this helps you to remember the different learning modes. And as always, if you have questions, feel free to type them into the chat box. So Susan, what, what are people thinking? What does this look like? Uh, well, it looks like director's preferred method is reading and then maybe okay. doing. Um, and that uh, facilities managers prefer doing. That makes sense to me. How about you? Well, I, you know, I don't like to make too many judgments about about categories of people. Um, I'm, I, although I'm not surprised to see these results, but I, I do feel like, um, for me, asking is is humbling, but it's usually the best way <laughs> for me to to take on something new. So. Um, it kind of synthesizes a bunch of different other modes. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move on. Um, so, can we go back to the the presentation? Thanks. Um, so now I'm going to shift to actually specific kinds of emergency training sessions. So I'm going to start with planning. We have two types of training. Uh, benchmarking and tabletops. So as Susan said before, you have a link to download a document in the lower left corner of your screen. This is our um, Live and Learn handout, and it has resources that I'm going to mention throughout the presentation. You don't need to look at it right now, but on it is a link to Harvard's benchmarks template that you see one, one page of here on your screen. For writing your emergency plan, um, you, you want to get the high level decision makers in the room for a benchmarking session. Since they will be identifying goals, it's good to schedule this a few weeks before they sit down to do annual planning for the organization. You want the organization's director your emergency team head, your facilities manager, and maybe a couple of other interested people in the room. And in about an hour and a half, I feel like uh, the group can review the individual goals that are in four different sections. So there's a planning section, which you see here. Then there's facility. There's staff preparedness. Um, and the goals are all prioritized into basic, good, and best practices. So I don't know if this type is too small for you to see, but the, the top section is basic, and then there's the good and then best practices. Uh, the basic goals are, in my mind, the first priorities, but they're not necessarily the easiest things to accomplish. For each goal, the team can then mark checkboxes to say that each goal has been met, or partly met, or not yet. Um, there's also space to write comments, questions. You know, to you can assign staff who are responsible for the goal, or you can identify follow-up tasks. So you can fill out the benchmarks at an internal meeting like that. Um, but I have a better idea for you. You can also host a regional event. You can invite a bunch of other local institutions that have cultural heritage collections. And you can do it together. To make it more interesting, you can incorporate a discussion panel with local experts before the benchmarking exercise. You might want to include your local emergency manager, who is often the, the fire chief. You could invite any number of people, maybe an insurance claims adjuster, um, someone from your local cultural association who will talk about building a network. 
um, maybe a health and safety person from fire department or someone from public works, your city planner, a town clerk, or maybe even someone from your state emergency management agency. Um, and this group of people can talk to everyone about communication and collaboration from their different points of view. After the discussion panel, you might want to leave maybe a half an hour to get started on the benchmarking exercise. So each organization sits at a table, and you go through probably only one of the four sections of the benchmarks. Um, and the experts from the discussion panel can wander around the room and coach the teams on their goals and priorities. Um, the teams will then have to finish up their benchmarks and goal setting on their own time. Now, here's something interesting. A bonus for doing it this way, um, or really any other group training where you gather multiple organizations in your area, is that it can become the foundation for a mutual aid agreement. And that means that you'll help each other out in the case of an emergency. You will have talked ahead of time about who has which kinds of resources. And maybe you'll even have decided how you're going to pay each other back for them if you need to. So Harvard's benchmarks work for our organization. And you are welcome to use them. Um, on the, the link is on the handout again. But you might want to tweak them to make them appropriate for your organization and your community. So here are some other resources that can give you ideas for customizing your benchmarks. And links to all these are included on your handout. Many states have a statewide emergency network for cultural organizations like COSTEP. Um, and sometimes it's related to a program called Alliance for Response. But there are also many other names for these organizations. BPLAN is an online template for a disaster plan. And the Northeast Document Conservation Center is in the process of upgrading it. And a new, uh, a new version will be available next year. The PREP plan, or Pocket Response Plan, is from the Council of State Archivists. And it's a slightly shorter version of a disaster plan. Um, and you can also take a look at Harvard's emergency plan template, that thing in the blue, the blue, the blue square. That was used as the basis for our benchmarks document. So you can see how we got from an emergency plan to a benchmarking document. So once a plan is in place, you've got to get the whole team engaged to learn and to practice the plan. So for a tabletop exercise, you want to get your team members, your coworkers, maybe your volunteers who have supervisory responsibilities. Um, you want to get these people together to test and practice and learn the plan, basically from the, com the comfort of your own conference room table. You can do a tabletop during a staff meeting. Um, you want to make sure to have different people who have different roles in the room, especially your facilities people, who in most cases carry the heaviest responsibility during an emergency. Harvard has written some templates for different scenarios. And again, there are links to these in your resources handout. So we have a hurricane, a minor water leak, a major pipe burst, construction dust contamination, and we are planning to develop a power outage scenario. If you decide to use them, you should customize them to make the scenario as realistic as possible for your organization. Um, and you probably want to start small with the minor leak and then work your way up to the more disastrous emergencies. So here's how it works. First, um, you want to get a board member or maybe somebody from a neighboring organization to act as a facilitator. The facilitator works with your emergency team letter leader ahead of time to prepare a scenario script. 
Then you turn the script into a presentation with slides that alternate between scenario slides, as you see on the left, and discussion slides with questions that prompt conversation on the right. There aren't necessarily right or wrong answers. Um, and as I said before, some people feel really awkward doing role playing. But the more that they can suspend disbelief, the more unanticipated issues are revealed that you can then work out ahead of time you know, before a real emergency hits. So the key is that testing your plan this way helps your team to internalize the plan and to improve it. OK, that's it for planning training. So if you have questions about tabletopping or benchmarking, feel free to type in the chat box. And remember that asking questions is also a great way to shift your brain into a higher gear and synthesize what you're learning. So now we're going to talk about four different types of response training that you see there. The Federal Emergency Management Agency's Incident Command System is the government's methodology for managing emergency response. They've developed an online training um, just for individuals called IS-100.B. It's free. Um, it takes a few hours, um, but it doesn't have any live components, so you can do it at any time. And anyone who is in a decision-making role and might be responsible for communicating with local and state officials during an emergency should take this individual training, um, like you library directors out there. Not just libraries, sorry. Organizational directors. So this will help you to understand how the first responders and the state officials are thinking when they're making decisions and assigning responsibilities that may impact your organization. Here are a couple of other online options. Um, there are several helpful C2C care webinars about response. And you can view the recordings at connectingtocollections.org. Um, now here is the other end of the spectrum from individual online training. And that is to do a full day, hands-on, literally immersive experience. A full day response workshop is logistically complex, and you have to plan it several months in advance. It's also another good opportunity to combine forces with local heritage organizations to get the most value for the time and energy that you're going to put into organizing it. And it is a great chance for people to build their professional networks. You might try to convince your town emergency manager to co-present with a preservation outreach person, maybe, from a regional conservation center. The target audience for this kind of training is frontline staff who are most likely to discover an emergency. So here's how we do it. We, we set up a mock emergency with non-collection materials in an outdoor parking lot with a storm drain nearby. It's on shel metal shelving that's set up with very sturdy cross bracing over the top. And you can see that we've actually braced it to a nearby fence just to make sure that it doesn't topple over. For collections, you can, or mock collections, you can use deaccession items, yard sale fines, donations, etc. You want to put them on just one or two shelves per ladder or unit. Um, you don't want to fill them because that's way too much. You end up wasting. Um, so you want to string up soaker hoses, which go above the shelving. You can see those green lines. Those are soaker hoses. And you're going to douse the materials with water overnight. The next morning, teams of participants start by looking for safety threats. And so we will put an electric cord into a puddle or have some heavy things kind of precariously located above people. Then we ask the participants to assess the source of the water, make sure that it's clean before they handle anything. 
and also to note any structural damage. We have them quickly document the formats and the amounts of collections that are at risk of damage. And then each team makes a phone call to someone who is primed ahead of time. So they're not calling 911, but maybe they're calling your facilities staff. And they practice reporting the emergency. And this is where their role playing skills really do um, come to play. Then we have them protect collection materials by draping the shelves with plastic sheeting. And we also teach people to learn strategies to safely remove the wet items from the shelf. And this is where it really can help to have a conservator or a preservation specialist around to advise on this. The hands-on activities in the full day training alternate with indoor presentations and discussions. We have a discussion panel with a facilities manager, a health and safety expert, and a police officer. And they talk about safety and collaboration during emergency response. Then we ask collection managers who have dealt with actual emergencies to present case studies. And they are giving tips on communication and decision making. A registrar discusses documentation and insurance issues. And as you all know, the stress of an emergency can impair your judgment, which can lead to injuries or mistakes during the response. So we bring in a psychologist who talks to us about how to recognize our physiological and emotional response to emergencies. So you probably already know this, but in a real emergency response, Taking breaks can really help to bring that other half of your brain back online. It's good if you schedule breaks into training and point out to the participants that that's what you're doing so that they realize how important it is to take breaks. In a real or emergency, um, individual breaks help people to refuel and to relax their body and their brain. But group breaks are also important. It's a time to have a good belly aching laugh at the absurdity of the situation. People can share what they've learned about how to do their tasks better. And they get to hear what else is going on. And people are always curious about that. So these are learning opportunities and also, at the same time, stress relief. Now, if you don't have the resources for a full day workshop, consider condensing it into a one hour session. In the resources, I've shared a link with you for a presentation that we use for a one hour student worker and volunteer training. And you can customize it to fit your organization. In the one hour training, participants learn the bare essentials of response. So first, they're going to learn local communication protocols, and it helps to have a wallet-sized card printed up with basic contact info. You'll have them look at images in a presentation and call out the safety risks that they see. Then they're going to talk about how to do rapid building and collection damage assessment and go over basic me methods for preventing further damage. Excuse me, I have to cough. I'm going to take a very short break. OK, I'm back. Sorry about that. Um, I like to do a quick hands-on demonstration of the difference between damp, wet, stained, and mold damaged books. And then the group goes into collection storage and looks for the emergency supplies, and then tries draping plastic over the storage units or shelving. And if they're real Cracker Jacks, you can have them set up a funnel into a trash can. Um, and they don't have to do this with water, but they just get the practice doing funneling it from the, the plastic. And they can also take a stab at estimating, let's say, how many items are in a whole row of storage. 
So that's it for response. Um, feel free to type your questions into the chat box. Now we're going to talk about salvage training. For a delightful introduction, you can check out C2C CARES webinar from 2015 on salvage and recovery. And now I'll talk about how you can organize your own salvage training. Because 97% of Harvard's library emergencies involve water, our salvage training focuses on wet materials. The goal of salvage training is for the collection staff to learn practical techniques for recovering collections that have gotten wet. The salvage training is logistically very complex with lots of people and supplies and space needed. But it's much less emotional than the response training. And that's because the materials are pulled out of the storage context and they're dumped in a bucket full of water. So it just doesn't feel real. And that takes a little bit of the stress out of it. You want a conservator or preservation expert to lead this training because the instructor really needs to understand the material nature of the collections and how they react to water. For our library training, we group together uh, formats of book, paper, and photographs. And then we do audiovisual audio materials separately. But you can also do paintings, objects, textiles, furniture, whatever, whatever you got. So in the salvage training, the first thing we talk about is how to assess how much material is damaged and how severe the damage is to that material. Then we establish priorities for what to stabilize first and what can wait. We demonstrate handling and air drying techniques for different formats. And then we show people how to pack items for transport or freezing. Participants practice the techniques that they learned or that, that we demonstrated during hands-on sessions. And they get their own bucket of wet items. And they have to assess, prioritize, air dry, and then pack them. Now, in my experience, some people find it difficult to accurately identify specific audiovisual formats. <clears throat> this makes it very hard to salvage them because the different formats have different requirements for salvage. So we supplement the AV salvage training with a half-day session on AV format identification. Um, your local archivist may know of an audiovisual expert who could help you to set priorities if you have a lot of audiovisual collections, and maybe collaborate on a hands-on workshop on identification and salvage. OK, now I'm going to toss the ball to you again. Mike, can we have polls 9 and 10, please? OK, so first we're going to review some of the main ideas that I've talked about so far. And I'm asking you to choose the ones that resonate with you. Now, I want to suggest that whichever three you choose, take a look at the benchmarks document or your own emergency plan after this webinar, and figure out a goal or two for the next year that you could suggest for your organization. The next poll is just a check-in to see how many of you are familiar with the debrief concept and how deeply it's embedded in your organization. <clears throat> okay, it looks like we've got a nice spread of things in uh, the key principles. Right, but it looks like the team collaboration, safety first, and involving the facilities managers are the leading ones. Yeah. All right. Well, that's, that's interesting, because that can also help me to shape future training like this one. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I think we're slowing down, so um, I'll ask Mike if we can move on. Okay, so now we're going to talk about after action reviews, also known as debriefs. So this is a meeting that's held with the key players after the emergency's dust has settled somewhat. I have been to some painful debriefs where people point fingers and play the blame game. And then that makes other people at the table get defensive and they shut down. But I've also been to some really productive debriefs with aha moments and genuine gratitude. And that gets everyone in the mood to talk about how to follow up and what, you know, what next steps are going to be taken. So the key in a debrief meeting really is to focus on what you can learn from the experience. So what do you talk about in this kind of meeting? Well, you do want to briefly summarize what happened, but don't dwell again too much on whose fault it was, because that's the quickest way to put people on the defensive and derail the meeting. Instead, you want to focus on what lessons you've learned and what you would do differently next time. And then you can make plans to mitigate the risks that are still threatening your building and your collection. Here are some other keys to an effective after action meeting, which are to act on what was discussed in the meeting. First, you want to share the meeting notes with everyone who attended so that they can make their own corrections. You want to update your emergency plan with any new procedures or information that will be used in the future. You want to tie the mitigation plans to the budget and annual planning priorities so they'll actually get done. <clears throat> Making someone accountable for getting them done and following up until you can check that thing off your goals. And eventually, then, you have made it back to the beginning of the emergency preparedness life cycle. So you can take another look at your benchmarks. Now you might ask, how can you get your organization to learn how to hold effective debriefs? Well, you can start now. Whenever you do a big project, an event, etc., you can use an after action or debrief meeting to learn from your mistakes to record what you improvised or what changed from the original plan on the fly. And you can talk about how to improve the next event or project. Getting in that habit of doing debriefs will make it seem natural to also do this after you have an emergency. OK, Mike, one more time. Poll number 11, please. This is just to reinforce. You guys are good. <laughs> All right. So I'm not going to belabor this too much. Yeah. Can, um, no one is suggesting Mike, to on? find the culprit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So Mike, can we have, go back to the slides? Great, thanks. So here is how I would have answered the poll and how many of you did as well. You want to focus on learning from it. Um, now, you'll note that this is the only poll that has an answer key, and it's still a little bit of a judgment call. I just want to say that I found that asking questions with right or wrong answers and yes or no kind of things, um, it stops the conversation and it doesn't necessarily stretch people's minds too far. Whereas if you ask people to choose between several decent, decent options and get them to kind of make a judgment, um, that I think keeps people more engaged and learning. OK, we're getting close to the end, so I'm going to give you two more polls. And I want you to use these to set some intentions for yourself and for your organization. So this can become a learning plan for you. 
If you want to let me know about your learning plan and let me know if you'd like to receive a follow-up email, I want to ask you to put the word consent, C-O-N-S-E-N-T, into the chat box. And by doing this, you are giving me explicit permission to email you the data from your individual polls and your chat. Um, but I'm only going to send you yours. I'm not going to send you everybody's. Uh, I would also follow up in a couple of months to share that data again as a reminder of the intentions that you set today. Now, I'm not going to analyze your intentions or anything like that. It's just um, a way to help you um, to hold yourself accountable for today. All right, so now we get to talk about some of your questions. Susan, what do you have for me? What do you suggest? Well, we haven't we had about? many questions. There was a discussion early on about um, uh, learning modes, and Jess Miller Camp pointed out with a lot of uh, references why learning modes are bunk. And um, but Nora Lachin said that she finds it interesting. And then uh, Nora offered to share the zone-wide power outage scenarios from the Smithsonian <clears throat> with you for tabletops. Oh, and that's great. Now, the table, your tabletops are, are in, a, um, in a Google uh, place so they can be updated, right? That's correct. Yep. So okay. the link is so, to a Google folder. And so yeah. if we make updates um, or, you know, or add new uh, ones, they'll be people there. could add new ones. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's, that's in the worksheet, and the worksheet will be posted. And then um, Andrew, Rob, they do training very often, and he says they do a tabletop every Halloween. <laughs> um, it seems to be the right time to get people to role play. And, and are they in costume? <laughs> yeah. And or maybe they get uh, to switch roles. Okay. And Andrew says, can you talk about assessment? How much and how severe? How, and how to train? You think um, Andrew wants to talk about how to how to train people to do that? So I don't know um, he's typing right now. I think he'll let us know. So we start small, and this is um, in the in the response workshop um, where where we we do more of the how much, um, and then we do the how severe is more in the salvage workshop. So the how much you start by having people actually count the number of items that are on a shelf, just physically count them, just to get a. Uh, some kind of number, and then you you challenge them to figure out well how many shelves are in this whole aisle, and and they can just basically do basic math, which in an emergency situation is remarkably hard to do, <laughs> even simple multiplication. But um, but just starting with that number of things that are on a shelf, a average number helps you to get a sense of how many items we're talking about. So that's one way to do it. And then you point out to people that, well, vendors don't tend to care how many things that you have. So if you have a big emergency and you're going to engage with a vendor, what they want more is linear feet. So you just get a tape measure and you measure all the shelves that are affected and you give them that number. Um, but if you know those two things ahead of time, um, that can help you maybe gauge whether you're going to call a vendor. I know here at Harvard we have a 200-item limit. So if there are more than 200 books, we're calling a vendor. Um, and that's because that's the amount of space that we have in our local, you know, in our freezer that is here on campus. So um, that's why we're counting items to begin with. Um, but then... If I'm making a call to a vendor, I need to give them linear feet because that's how they're going to decide 
how big a truck to send and how many boxes and how many people, how many hands. Mm -hmm. um, then in terms of severity, you know, um, that, that, that is factored in in various places. So um, when we're showing people a damp book versus a wet book versus something with stains that's actually dry, it really is in that physical handling of it that they, they come to realize that those are, those are different things and you might be able to prioritize those differently. Um, so you know, we focus that on the books um, because that's what we ha the most of what we have in our collections. Let's see. Okay, okay, what is linear? I'm looking at Andrew's comment about what is linear feet compared to 200 books. I don't know. <laughs> it depends on the know. size of books, Andrew. <laughs> um, I'm going to say, you know, 200 books is usually like uh, six shelves for us. So mm -hmm. that's going to be nine, nine or ten linear feet. I don't know how good yeah. my math is on the fly, but that's that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Okay. So um, Dee Stubbs uh, Lee said uh, they've also helped with leaks and floods of various sizes and post-fire cleanup, um, and that's that's been. They've all been completely different experiences. So I think the question from that is, how, how do you make one experience, how do you apply that to another completely different experience? Hmm, that's a good one. Um, I would say it's, it's more about the meta lessons. Um, I, I too have found that every experience is different. And I'll say that on our emergency team, we have about one emergency a month. So we have a lot of practice, and they're all different. And what we learn is much more about how to stay flexible, how to stay calm, how to improvise, um, using a buddy, to make sure that if you make a decision that it isn't limiting you, um, that you have considered all the different points of view. Um, and this also, all those things come up in the debrief meeting so that you might come away with a list of tasks like, you know, let's fix the roof or let's remove that tree limb that's, that's you know, going to break through a window. Um, but you also want to make sure that you're thinking about, well, how are we going to communicate? How did we communicate this time, and how would it have been different if we did it another way? Um, who did we leave out of the loop? You know, I've, I've had major emergencies where a key financial administrator was not copied on the first email, and that created all kinds of problems because then when we tried to call the vendor, the financial person didn't know what needed to be approved. Um, so mm -hmm. that was a lesson learned, you know. Um, so you can write into your plan, remember to call the financial person or email them. Um, but even better is to, is to have that mindset of who have I forgotten to call, you know, and, and ask somebody, okay, here are the people that I called. Who else do I need to call? Help me fill in the gaps. Um, so those would be the things that are my first reaction. Do you have any thoughts? Um, Andrew says, I would say that we learn uh, that what we learn is how to work together. That helps every time, no matter the incident relationships. Uh, relationships are fundamental. Um, I'll, I totally agree with that. So Joan Baccarat asked if any of our webinars are in YouTube, and in fact, all of our webinars are, are backed up on the AIC YouTube channel. And those get put up every few months. So that they are usually a few months behind where we are. If you go in our archive, um, there are webinars that are closed captioned. And those, the closed captions are all on YouTube. 
and there's a link. So if you see that, um, and I see Emmanuel Dabney has put up uh, the YouTube link for AIC uh, websites, but they're they're also all on our website. So you can use the new search uh, tool and search a topic and click webinar, and it'll come up with all the webinars that are on that topic. And just as a reminder, part of what's going to change is the resources page that's currently on the web uh, the website's going to go away, and it's going to become the uh, uh, faceted search, uh, which will make it easier to find everything. And there are about a thousand resources that are really curated for small and mid-sized institutions. So you can look forward to that. Um, and I don't see any other questions. Are there any questions coming up? Priscilla, do you have anything more to add? I don't think so. I do. Um, I we do have to remind people to fill out the evaluation. So that's going to be the last thing that pops up. Um, right. Because I will, I will take your feedback to heart. <laughs> I really do like um, getting feedback from presentations. And this is the first time I've done this one. So I would love to hear your thoughts. Um, I'm going to think um, about the, uh, the debunking of learning modes. I know I have had some very interesting conversations with my colleagues uh, where they have they have shown me very clearly that my mode is different from theirs, and they helped me to realize that I need to accommodate these different needs. And maybe the, the actual modes aren't so realistic, but I guess the, the fundamental fact is that people learn in different ways. Um, and right, it, and people need to be involved in getting ready for emergencies. You can't just say, we have a plan and never do anything. Yep, and I can say I have sat down recently with, with a library who said, yep, we have a plan. We haven't looked at it in a while, um, but we have a plan. And they were very proud that they have a plan, but they don't have a clue what's in it. <laughs> so um, yeah. So we do really need to work on that. Um, and, I think, um, you know, we have done so much, you know, in the history of our field, we have done so much emphasis on getting plans written and not on training. Um, and, it, you know, when it comes down to it, you're not, you can't read the plan in the heat of the moment. I, you know, I, I can't read at all when I'm, when I'm panicking. And I need to be able to rely on those instincts that I've trained for um, and on the people around me, too. So, and Stephanie um, Moore says, thank you, we have no plan currently. And I would say, Stephanie, use D-Plan. There are lots of emergency plan templates um, that are available. And it helps to get a plan and think about what kind of emergencies you might encounter. In Bellevue, Washington, you might encounter an earthquake. Um, and so you want to make sure that your plans fit what might happen to you. Um, and Jeff Miller Camp says, I think it's more that it gets applied by putting people in strict, oh, she's talking about mo uh, learning modes, in strict boxes rather than that there are not different ways of learning. There are, but people are more flexible than typical application acknowledges. Um, right. You don't, you don't want to just hem people into a box and say, this is the right. way you're going to learn today. Um, but my point is I try to provide a variety of different kinds of learning experiences so that people who are stronger in one area um, get something out of that and that the people in, you know, in other areas you know, maybe, and, maybe get challenged a bit, but we don't leave anybody out. Um, Carol King says, uh, can you suggest sources for emergency plans? Yes, if you look on our website and look in the search and do emergency plans, <clears throat> There's a lot of information on emergency plans. Um, and by our website, you mean the, connect, the uh, Connected, connected to Collections, collections Care. Care. Yeah. yeah. 
and um, and please fill out the evaluation. They're very important to us. I look at them. The, our webinar presenters look at them. The webinar committee looks at them. And uh, in the next few weeks, if you get, uh, which you will if you attended this webinar, our survey, please fill it out. That's also important to help us get funding and to help us know that we're doing the same thing. And uh, Joanne martinez Kilgore put in um, a evaluations and risk evaluation and planning program from uh, conservation.us.org, which is very good. Look at that. And I think if there are no other questions, we're about <clears throat> at the end. Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. Um, so thank you, Priscilla, and thank you, everyone, for coming. We'll see you um, the end of the summer in August uh, for uh, difficult materials. And in the meantime,